So John, yeah, ask yourself. So John waited for two and a half years to see if anybody loved him. And last year you did. So this is the first year in the program that he's been involved. And we invested $2,000 to make it possible for him. And that is all it takes for him to get all the things that he talked about. So we want to thank you for doing that. Not only did we do that this last year, we also this year... Um, took the initiative to help the first gentleman you saw on the screen, Abel. Abel, basically, when he was called into this ministry, he said that God called him to ravens. He said the ravens are, in his words, the dirty birds. <laughs> that literally, the way that people look at homeless children in Africa is that it's dirty birds. They just kind of come and take and leave. And so it got on his heart so deeply that he wanted to do this, and God called him to do this, that ultimately what happened was the only way he could start this ministry was to sell his car. And 12 years ago, over a decade ago, he sold his car, and he's been without a car for 12 years. But with the generosity of a gift that you've already given and the generosity of some other givers, we were able to buy him a nice used car so he can do ministry around the nation of Kampala. So thank you guys for making that possible. Let me ask you a question. Have you already gotten the Christmas spirit? Hey, every orifice of my house has been invaded with Christmas. There's stuff hanging on the doors. There's stuff outside. There are gifts in the closet. The house has been transformed into this house of light. It's just been absolutely amazing. And the transformation will continue in the days and weeks to come. Hey, listen, I've already got some Christmas things out of the way. Um, have you have you bought any stuff already? I mean, they say you're going to spend like one to two trillion dollars over this weekend and through Cyber Monday and Giving Tuesday and all those kinds of things. Anybody, any of y'all go to the mall? Okay. Anybody go to the Amazon? There we go. Anybody got to go to the eBay all? All right. That's good. Well, however you do it, this is that time of the year when we are going to get something for someone else. And we're remembering people that we love and God has brought so many powerful things to remind us of Christmas. So how many of you really just your favorite Christmas thing is like the Charlie Brown Christmas show, the Charlie Brown Christmas special, right? There's nothing like a little bit of Charlie Brown at Christmas. You can forget the modern graphics, baby. Just give me Linus in his blankets and Schroeder going, ding, 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 ding. I just love that. And last night, I, I went ahead and got it out of the way. I saw It's a Wonderful Life again for the 748,000th time in my life. And I cried <laughs> when George Bailey said Bedford Falls. I get emotional thinking about it because I think about you. And I think about what would this world be like without you. I think what would this world be without somebody that had come before you to make it possible for you to live in a free country. So we're finishing this series. Some people thought we were going to preach this series till Jesus came back, but we're finishing today. Um, I have a friend, and maybe you have a friend, who doesn't care anything about immigrants or care anything about those people who are refugees or outsiders. Well, I would have you know today that we're, we've got one of two messages that are definitely not going to be preached on either extreme. One of those messages is, uh, just let them all in, baby. It ain't no problem. Let them all come in. If they can get in somehow, let them in. Neither is it keep them all out. It's enough for us to be here. I will remind you that we have to find what God wants us to find, the happy medium in the answer of immigration. But it begins with Jesus. Here's what you and I need to remember about Jesus. From before the time he was born, he was an outsider migrating to somewhere. Literally, he had to leave his town where his dad lived, and his dad made a living because somebody from a far-off government said, you have to go to another town, the town of your father's father's father, 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 David, somewhere down the line, and you have to go and be counted. And when he gets to town, there was no room for Jesus in that town. But it doesn't stop there. Stop for just a moment. And let's think about what these people really are. If you're taking notes today, if you're following along and you have it in your, on your app or you've picked up the paper notes in the back, we're going to talk today about outsiders. 
Jesus was an outsider. He always was an outsider to this world. And outsiders, we use various different words for them. Migrants, refugees, displaced, homeless people, asylum seekers, stateless persons, visitors. I would dare say that everybody in this room has been one of those at some time or another. Have you ever been stuck in an airport overnight? You've been homeless overnight. (laughs) Have you ever been stuck by the side of the road with a broken down car? Well, you've been at least displaced, homeless, or somebody that was just visiting that culture, and you didn't really want to stay in that culture. Has anybody ever experienced the feeling of being an outsider? I know I sure have. I moved nine times before I was 11 years old. I made friends like this. Hey, how are you doing? Bye. Hey, how are you doing? Bye. Can I sit with you at lunch? Okay, I got to go. But Jesus was the ultimate outsider. Not only that, as we begin this Christmas season with the beginning, Jesus was not born in his hometown. And immediately after he was born, He was not able to go back to live in his town permanently because Herod, the ruler of that day, found out that there was a king to be born in Bethlehem. He sent his soldiers to Bethlehem to slaughter all newborn infants. And God warned Joseph in a dream, don't go back to where you normally live. Run to Egypt. Literally, Jesus spent the first years of his life in a foreign country. Now, what if they didn't admit him? They go, well, Jesus was son of God, and Jesus would have done things the right way, and he would have followed all the rules. Well, possibly, maybe. And maybe that's why he was given shelter in that country. But what do we do with the people that are in and around us and those that are literally dying to get in this country. And I'm going to have to know that if your extreme is just let them all in, or if your extreme is just keep them all out, that you do not have the heart of God. You, You might have your own heart. You might have your own selfish heart. You may have your own way of doing things. You might have the way that pleases your party, whether it be red or blue. But God has given us a different heart. And today we're going to talk about everything. But I want you to see, first of all, that you and I potentially take in Jesus when you take in outsiders. Now, I know, I know that there are all kinds of complicating factors in this decision. I know that there are people that have snuck in. I know that there are people that have been smuggled in. I know there are people that have come in to try to blow people up. We know all about that. 9-11 happened, and we have never been the same and will never be the same. But here's what we need to know, according to the words of Jesus Christ, is that you potentially take in Jesus when you take in someone who is an outsider. Jesus said in the end of times, he said that I will come before you for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Did you do that? Did you do that to the person that looked different than you, the person whose skin was different than you, the person who stood in front of you in the grocery store line and they weren't speaking your language, did you realize that they might have been sent by him to you? Because when you took them in, you took him in. Second, remember, you came from somewhere else too. Treat them kindly. I I have nothing to do with the fact that Andrew Hardy in 1705 hit the shores of the Outer Bank, of the Outer Banks of North Carolina. I have nothing to do with that. At that particular moment in time, it was okay for anybody to land, anybody to take root, anybody to build a life in America. I have nothing to do with it. And I am grateful that because he did that, and then they had children, and then they had children, and they had children, and here I am. (laughs) 
but we've all come over in different boats, y'all. But we're in the same boat now. Do not oppress a foreigner. God says these words. Incidentally, everything that I say today that does not have a filter of God's word should be ignored. But everything I say today that comes from God's word should pass through the filter of keep them all out, to pass through the filter of let them all in. Do not oppress a foreigner, God said. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt. Do you know that when the children of Israel, when God's children got up out of Egypt, you remember that, right? The Ten Commandments. To me, when I get to heaven, I'm going to look for Charlton Heston because he's going to show me who Moses looks like. Let my people go. Pharaoh. Let my people go. Do you realize that when they left, that some Egyptians went with them? Do you realize that when they made their transition through the desert, that they picked up some people along the way? Do you know even that if you go and you read and you study God's Word in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, you will see that God also provided for those that came along with them. He says, don't oppress foreigners. Instead, take care of them. Wait a minute. I thought God said to keep them all out. There was supposed to be a holy. He says, if they will come and if they will be among you and if they will live according to the rules that I give you, then you include them. Do you know something else? That not only were they to do that, they were to help feed people that were foreigners among them. Literally, those people that developed farming and crops and they developed farms and they grew various different kinds of things and harvest. That they, they were literally instructed by God not to harvest all of their field, but to leave some of the edges of the field, to leave some of the profits there for those who did not have and those that were poor and those that were hungry among them to come and to partake of what they had left over that was intentionally left over. One of the things I have you know during this Christmas season is that when, when we receive your offerings for Christmas, as we receive every dollar, it is carefully stewarded. It is carefully vetted. And it goes to people that are genuinely in need and to programs. And we always highlight, highlight them to you. And I'm so thankful for some people who have already taken the lead to say, I'm going to give my first and my best gift to Christ at Christmas. And I'm going to channel it through the local church. You'll have an opportunity to do that throughout the month of December and continuing in the month of January. And when we do so, we take care of people like John. We take care of people like Abel. We take care of people like foster children that live in this community. We take care of children that Otherwise, would not know how to swim by paying for swimming programs in the local YMCA so that every kid that goes learns how to swim before they leave. We pay to help feed people who can't feed themselves. There are tens of thousands of dollars and literally fifty to 60,000 meals that we provided to children through the Backpack Weekend Food Program to children that are on free and reduced lunch and otherwise they are likely to go hungry in their family on the weekend. You do that... Every week, you do that when you give because you care about those that are on the fringes as God has instructed us care for them. Next, stay golden with them. The same rule you desire applies to them. There's a golden rule. No, it's not he who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> Although sometimes it seems like that, doesn't it? You and I have been given the opportunity to love people as God has loved us. It doesn't mean that we accept everything they do. It doesn't accept, mean we accept the things that have been done illegally. <coughs> but it does say that we're given the opportunity to love them. Listen. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not ill-treat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native-born. Love them as yourself. 
For you were foreigners in Egypt. And then God says, I am the Lord your God. I am saying this. I am putting my name at the end of this like a P.S. at the end of the letter. Don't just think you can exclude people. Next, include strangers in community. In- include strangers and in- include outsiders and in- include refugees and in- include people that don't speak your language. Include people that you ultimately would not hang out with. Decide that you're going to be friends with somebody that is a different color than the skin that you have. Decide that you're going to be somebody that's going to be generous to people even if you don't know where they've come from or if they followed all the rules. Listen, y'all, there is a God, and this God will take care of those that don't follow the rules. And sometimes he uses government. More about that in just a moment. Listen to this. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Isn't that cool? I wonder if my angel looks like Clarence. I really hope my angel looks like Roma Downey. (laughs) Only she's beautiful, but she can throw down. I don't know. And we have this conception, too, that, you know, perhaps you know the line from It's a Wonderful Life that every time a a bell rings, what happens? And you got got that this, right? Hey, guess what, y'all? We don't even know that angels have wings. Oh, come on, man, you're ruining Christmas for me. No, nah, this Christmas I'm going to bring wings to you, and I'm going to talk to you about the wings over Christmas. After we celebrate with our kids' point time, and they, as they lead us into the season, we're going to be talking about how, what God's wings do for us and where wings come from. And hopefully you're going to soar and you're going to fly like never before this Christmas season. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. You know what? I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes in my life, I tend to be judgmental. I tend to profile people. I tend to throw people into slots. I tend to see where people live, what they drive, what they wear. And God has taught me over my lifetime something that I I, I still fight, by the way, maybe some of you do as well, to not slot people into slots, but to realize There is a living soul that's in front of me. It is the most amazing creation in all the world. They're not just people in my way. They're people that Jesus died for. I want to tell you something. Every time I get critical, and I get critical, whether it's behind the the wheel of a car or whether it's in an airport or whether I'm watching people on TV and I'm going, God, the wrong people live and the wrong people die. There's a spirit that lives inside of those who are believers. And here's what he says to me. That's somebody I came for. That's somebody I died for. You treat them like I would treat them. Because I'm treating you that way. Next, you and I are part of a different kingdom. If you have said yes to Christ, if you have said, I am turning over my sinful life, I want Jesus to cover my sins and to carry me and to guide me all of my life. If I want God to to put in me the love that I can give to him so I love him with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my mind and with all of my strength, then God uniquely has done something in you and me. We do live in the United States of America, but our permanent residency is in a place with God called heaven. One of Jesus' followers who slept with him by the fire and ate dinner with him and walked on water to him and cut people's ears off when people came after Jesus, said, since you call on the Father who judges each work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. There's another translation, in reverence and awe. Man, we are awed by this Christmas story, aren't we, aren't we? 
We love our mangers, and we love our wise men, and we love our camels and our donkeys that they rode on, and we love our stars, and we love our light, and we love our red and our green, and we love our Christmas trees, and we love all of that stuff. Let me just tell you something, y'all. I love it, too. But all of that is here to point us back to the babe in a manger who became a man who was tempted in every single way that you are and yet was without sin so that you and I could have God's righteousness and he offered himself and his life so you and I might live life and life more abundantly. What are you going to do with that this Christmas season? One of the things that we do and have done over the last couple of Christmases is offer opportunities for people that have said yes to Christ at some point in their life. They've prayed a prayer before they went to bed and they've thrown their arms up and they've just said, God, please help me. I, I, I need something more. There, there's others of you in, that have in this room, you, you've raised your hand. There are others of you that have watched online and you've, you've crossed the line of faith and they're Others of you that have you've heard a message and it's it inspired you and, and you didn't raise a hand or pray a prayer, but you checked off on the box, I, I'm giving my life to Christ. Or you've made this decision privately. God has called you to go public. Not to go public on the basis of what your parents did for you. Lord, we, we care about that too. We, we dedicate young children, but... There is something about somebody when they come of age, whether it's 6, 16, 26, or 66, and they say, I want to identify with my Savior and my Lord. And so we're going to do baptism in each one of our Christmas services. Maybe now is the time. Bob, hey, y'all check your watches. Is it December the 1st? It is. It's December the 1st. It's, it's our camera operator's birthday back there. Y'all say, hey, camera, it's her birthday. Some other great people have birthdays in December, including my wife. I'll tell you when it is because I want you to celebrate. I just want you to say happy birthday in general for December. You got a month to plan it. On Thursday, on Sunday, on Tuesday, Christmas Eve. Maybe what it is that you're going to do is to say, you know what? I give myself to Jesus publicly because I have given myself to him privately and I want the whole world to know I belong to him if that's something you want to offer it's the greatest present of this Christmas season not only to you but to those around you fathers there are children that are waiting to see what you're going to do mothers there are husbands to see if what you said happened to you privately is something you take seriously children there are parents that will follow in obedience because you as a child will lead them. Baptism is possible. If you will go outside, there's a sign where it says baptism, and there's somebody there that will sign you up and get you ready. You can start sending notes to Aunt Mabel and Uncle Harry that live in far off places to invite them to come in. Because Jesus said, once you say yes to me, I want you to show the world that you say yes to me. In Ephesians, we see these words, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. Hey, let's show the world we belong to him this Christmas season in the way we live, in the way we give, in the way that we love, in the way that we serve. Can you begin to think right now, what is it that I need to give of my time and my talent and my treasure this season? Because he gave it all to me. Now, I see a bunch of, of folks that are out there. I can see the kind of thought bubbles going up over your heads. And, and we have kind of leaned on this decision-making scale to this side in the first part of this message, haven't we? But, 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 here's what the Bible also says, but everyone has to follow the same rules when they come in. So what does that mean? 
It means Exodus 4, 12, 49, the same law applies both to the native born and to the foreigner residing among you. So people do have to follow processes. This past year, we had on the stage back in May a, a man by the name of Peter Hobby Adamanya. I just call him Hobby for short. Peter grew up as a kid abused in a home in Uganda, and he took a bus, finally ran away from home, and he was not quite a teenager. Peter lived as a street kid in Uganda for six years until somebody discovered him and saved him. Among the things that Peter had to do is that when street people would die, the street people would have to dispose of their bodies. The homeless people would have homeless funerals for those who died while they were homeless. Friday was a week ago. Peter, who grew up on the streets, and because of the gift of sponsorship like so many of you do in the life of this church, sponsoring a child, Peter came to America. And after almost a decade, he walked up to the front steps of the courthouse in Charlotte, North Carolina, along with dozens of other people from countries all around the world, and I got to be there to see him raise his hand and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. He just said it a whole lot prettier than I did. I pledge allegiance. He came in the right way. He followed the rules. So, so what do we do in this culture? I'm going to tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, these last few minutes, I could solve every problem in Washington, D.C. among people that are from both parties in this whole idea of immigration. You want to know what Ray Hardy's plan is? Here's what it is. If you're here illegally, everybody out. Everybody, not out of the country, everybody out. We need to know who you are. We need to know where you live, okay? Number two, if, if you come out and you've been bad, we're going to send you home. If we catch you and when you come out and you've been bad, we're going to send you home faster. But if you will come out, here is the second point in the plan. Everybody's got to register. By the way, for those people that say that all of our problems are going to be solved, if we just put them in buses and we put them in cattle cars and we ship them back home, that ain't ever going to happen. So don't, don't want it to happen. That's not what's supposed to happen. But how do they follow the rules? Here's point number three in the Ray Hardy immigration plan. And if enough Democrats and Republicans and independents and confused people would decide there was is everybody this here illegally has to appoint a member of their work, they have to go to work on a federal works project. If granddaddy snuck in here and granddaddy can't work in here anymore, then daddy has to go to work somewhere. It's some, just like the Federal Works Projects Administration back in the Roosevelt era. Let them have their way to earn their way in. And yes, we'll pay them. We're going to take care of them. Some of you are going like, I like what you said at first more than you said at the end. <laughs> well, God says we are to love unconditionally. But he also says to follow the rules. You know what's keeping a plan like that from happening? Because people want to get elected. I'm praying for a group of leaders in this country who will do the right thing even if it costs them their job. I'm going to. Some of y'all just voted me out of office just a moment ago. Some of y'all just fired me. <laughs> it's because somebody gave us a chance. We need to give them a chance, and we need to do so and they need to follow the rules. And we need to show them the grace that God has shed on America. So, so what? 
So what today? We want to go back to these four questions. We're going to explore these more in the, in the new year. As a matter of fact, one of our, our, our leaders, our drummer back here, Steve, and I were talking this week, and I said, what, what's something that you would love to hear about in the new year? He said, how do we get out of outrage culture? Well, we're just outraged about everything. So we're going to talk, and we're going to use these four words some more in the new year. So whatever the solution is, always, it has to be true. It has to be kind. It has to be helpful. And it has to be clear. So what the bottom line for today is, treat others kindly. Love others kindly and lead others justly. Would you pray with me? I invite you to stand if you would. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have brought us here to this place. Thank you for the gift of Christmas. Thank you for the gift of us being able to invite others into Christmas. Thank you, Father, for the privilege it is to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It's not just here for me, but it's here for every person of every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we ask that you inspire us this Christmas season to guide people to the one who can transform their lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Before you go today, just turn to somebody and shake their hand say, hello, good to see you. You're not a stranger to me now. You're my brother. You're my sister. My brother by another mother. But before you leave, as you leave today, we have invite cards to a Belmont Christmas. So you can take these cards and give them to your friends. They can easily go on the website and sign up. They can come with you. You can take them out for Christmas. Please grab some of those cards on the way out and begin inviting your friends to our Christmas services.